Okay, so welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, and uh, we'll have a talk by Paul Fendley from Oxford on free fermions and parafermions. All right, well, thanks to the organizers, especially Filippo for getting us here, which uh, one of these non-obvious things that was all gonna work out, but I'm so happy it did. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about something that is seemingly pretty different from, uh, I think, pretty much all the talks here at this conference, um, conference slash meeting, but I, I, it, it has something to do with integrability and I'll explain that as it goes on. So that's one of the three in the title. But also uh, I would call this type of workshop a methods-based workshop. And there's talks from lots of people doing different things. And I wanna, even though the method I'm describing here might be the oldest method um, that people are gonna discuss here, uh, uh, it's still very relevant and, and very distinct from, from the other ones that people are talking about, for, at least for the most part. Okay, so let me, why are we worked? Click on the, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah there we go, okay. But I should, Oh, there we go. Okay. Anyway, so, all right. So the system I'm going to talk about is free fermions. And I, I think it's fair to say it's the fundamental system in theoretical physics. A, a high percentage of all results in theoretical physics are related to free fermions. People could say free bosons maybe, but in condensed matter physics, for many reasons, free fermions are sort of more central. So if in particle physics, you call it tied, um, I'd say uh, free, uh, free fermions win because it condensed matter um, and of course, as probably everybody knows, the reasons why it's so exciting is because theorists like us can compute things exactly, um, and that's pretty nice. And, and to emphasize something I just said, free fermions are still really relevant, and we are still learning new things about free fermions. It's not a done deal. Uh, you know, I've so many times in my life I've seen this shrug, oh, it's just free fermions. But uh, you try computing, um, uh, for example, entanglement quantities in a free fermion system. It's, it's, it's doable, but it is not trivial. And lots of interesting things have been learned in recent years. Um, one of the things I'll especially emphasize today is they don't uh, always come up uh, where you expect them, or I should say they do come up sometimes when you don't expect them. And uh, one of the things also I'll emphasize today is uh, you can frame it in a fashion so it's very algebraic in nature. And uh, I'll be very precise about that. And again, at least people of my ilk uh, who study integrable models like algebra. So we'll do it that way. So uh, first of all, I'm going to try and answer the question, what is a free fermion? Which isn't obvious because you'll, you'll hear, I mean, lots of people will say, oh, it's free fermion because it has this property and all those things are right. But I want to give what I think is the, the basic property of a free fermion. And that's in, in a quantum system, I should say. No. In a quantum system, um, a free fermion will have a spectrum that looks like this. And so the energy, the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, let me do up here, I demanded this be. Um, the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian uh, are of this form where basically you have a bunch of things, energies that we could call energy levels usually. And then the entire spectrum is given simply by choosing the plus or minus signs in front of these levels. So this one would have two to the L different energy levels um, or different energies at least. Maybe there's some degeneracies. But the key thing that makes it free is the choice is independent. The choice of the plus or minus is independent of the values of epsilon. So lots, pretty much every beta ensemble solvable system, you write the spectrum in this form, but changing one of these signs will change the values of the epsilon. But this one, there's just one choice of epsilon for the system, provided you specify the boundary conditions and all sorts of stuff like that. And, and then that's the entire spectrum. So I think that's, to me, that's the fundamental property. And there's this nice picture, which, probably everybody's seen in some class they took at some point. Um, you basically draw the Fermi C, and that's if you take the minus sign, assuming the epsilon are real, as they are for Hermitian Hamiltonian. And then you, the ones with minus sign, so if you filled all the negative energy levels, that's the ground state. And then uh, if you 
then change one to a plus sign, you move it from up there and then get other energies. And so that picture is very useful in characterizing a system. So let me give you the canonical example. Probably this is review for many of you, but I'll try and say it in a fashion uh, that's a little bit different, even if you've seen this before. And if you haven't, well, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic feature of theoretical physics. And this is, you, you've got a Hamiltonian. And so let's take the simplest case. And this is when I can write down the Hamiltonian is a bilinear and some fermionic operator. So you know, I should say, so I, I'm going to do this in the quantum Hamiltonian framework. Everything I say goes over to many classical models. It's just easier to write out this way. It, it's, we'll get to some classical models uh, later on. But trust me, there's some technical, uh, comp I, I don't want to call them complications. There's just the formulas look nastier. That's pretty much about it. Conceptually, it's exactly the same. For a 2D classical system, uh, or a higher dimensional classical system working in a transfer matrix. But anyway, all right, so this is a quantum Hamiltonian. And I emphasized at the beginning, I was going to talk about things algebraically. So you got a bunch of operators acting on some Hilbert space. And um, to be honest, I don't need to tell you much about the Hilbert space to do what I'm about to do. So it's some operators, and they satisfy these anti-commutation relations. And this, this is for people who've seen this before. This is the Majorana basis. So each operator squares to the identity and then anti-commutes with all the others. And um, many systems can be written in this fashion. Um, some uh, transparently, you just say this is my definition, but there's many others. Um, including one mentioned this morning, that uh, you can rewrite the Hamiltonian after doing what's typically called a jordan wigner transformation um, into this form. And again, I'll say a little bit more about how that works later on, um, but that's not the main result of today. So let me, but let me give you an example of the traditional thing, which is probably the canonical example of all this. So here I do have a Hilbert space. So I guess I didn't write it out, but the Hilbert space is just a bunch of two site chains. So it's C2 to the L. So um, that's my Hilbert space and on each two state system, each C2. I've got the poly matrices acting on. I don't have to write out a basis, but they satisfy the usual poly matrices. So in the usual basis that people write down sigma x flips between the two states and the basis and sigma z measures one minus one is diagonal. And this is the icing Hamiltonian in the quantum Hamiltonian. Again, this all goes through to a classical system. And I wrote it in an open chain for the experts. I wrote this as an open chain for reasons that will be very important later. But this just flips the spins and this one just measures whether two neighboring spins are the same. And that's the quantum one plus one dimensional icing Hamiltonian. And uh, so this transformation I mentioned a few seconds ago, it's, uh, I didn't write it out. Um, it's not that difficult to write out. Um, it's, it's very standard now. Um, tr transforms this. It's a non-local transformation, defines these operators in terms of non-local combinations of these things. And it becomes a bilinear in terms of these fermions like I wrote out before. And in the, this is the form I wrote out before. There we go. Um, the form I wrote out before, just bilinear. And if you want, think of this bilinear as some matrix, and that's the matrix for this. So the key fact that makes these solvable, and, and I, I get so annoyed. Um, you know, you see solutions to the icing model, they mention uh, uh, doing a Bogolubov transformation, and Bogolubov was a great physicist. Um, but that's total unnecessary. Um, it's basic Bogolubov transformation in this language is, tip, is basically a Fourier transformation. But what I'm about to tell you is nothing whatsoever to do with translation invariance. It, it obscure, it's more complicated and it obscures the issue. So for example, I wrote that thing down with open boundary conditions and the Bogolubov transformation doesn't work. This is the way to solve the ISIC model. And I don't know why it's not taught this way, but here it is. It's the key fact is you've got a Hamiltonian that's bilinear, the thing I wrote down in the previous slide. And if you commute a Hamiltonian that's a bilinear in fermions with something that's linear in the fermions, so this is just some linear combination, the R's are just the coefficients, you get a linear back. Just obvious fact of that algebra I wrote down on the first one of, on one of the early slides. The fact that fermions 
operators anti-commute with each other. So this is automatic, because either each term here commutes with this, or it, an, or it doesn't anti-commutes, and you just get the other squares to one, so it gets back. And so here's how you solve it. One slide, modulo one other condition I need to put on the next slide. You just look, write down an operator that's one of these linear combinations here, and you compute the eigenvectors of this. So this, this is the linear combination. If you take this thing that's an eigenvector of this matrix, it's just high school linear algebra, then um, you see you can compute an operator, capital Psi here, that when you commute with the Hamiltonian, you get it back again. And the eigenvalues are just the zeros of a polynomial, the, the roots, the, well, the characteristic polynomial of that matrix. That's all, well, maybe up to a two, the way I define things. And, uh, and because it's Hermitian, these come in these plus minus pairs. And that's it, that's it. And in fact, I, I, I mentioned, I wrote down, uh, oops, I wrote down a translation invariant system, but I didn't have to. I could have made these couplings completely random. It would make this matrix more complicated. I can make long range interactions. As long as it's bilinear, it's, it's, you can compute these things. And these things are called raising and lowering operators. So what they do, so this is the relation I just derived by computing the eigenvalues of an L by L matrix and, or two L by two L matrix, and then these operators you have to show, but in this case it's really easy, these anti-commute with each other, which follows almost instantly from the fact that they're just built from distinct eigenvectors of the same matrix. So they satisfy this relation, and then you get exactly this picture I drew at the beginning of the talk, which is the e epsilons of the, come from the eigenvalues of this matrix and what this operator does exactly acting on an eigenstate uh, uh, shifts you, or raises a thing from there and there. And then the one of the opposite sign brings you back down again. So that's really all you need to do to solve the model. So you get that spectrum because this thing raises and lowers the energy by two epsilon k. All right, so hopefully uh, that was clear for you, I hope. And so now, okay, there's been tens of thousands of papers written doing variations on this theme, which is why some of us say, oh, it's just free fermions. But uh, shockingly, in these tens of thousand papers, no one ever asked until some quantum information did a, a few years ago, well, can you just tell by looking at some Hamiltonian if I can solve it via this trick I just used, the Jordan Wigner trick, basically. Uh, I mean, you can work out gazillions of examples, but without just working it out, because sometimes it really isn't obvious. And the answer was shockingly yes. <laughs> Maybe not shockingly yes, but shockingly simply yes. And, and it's really elegant, and I'll say a little bit more about how they did this down the line, but they, they wrote out, uh, associated with the Hamiltonian, you write down a graph, and it turns out at the same time graph theorists were uh, studying properties of graphs which coincided exactly with the ones they needed. And then you can tell, you look at the Hamiltonian, you write down this graph, and then you can tell from graph theory, yes, I can do this jordan wigner transformation and solve the model the way I just said, or I can't. And I'll tell you, like I say, I'll tell you a little bit more about how that works down the line. But okay, so, so finally you might have thought, well, that's now the end of the story. We have a very general way. There, maybe we'll learn new things about free fermion systems, but this is now a simple way to understand what ones uh, exist. But i um, happy to say um, the answer to this question I just asked is that all there is is no. And I'm gonna tell you in this talk some other operators, they're interacting. So if you apply the jordan wigner trickery, you get something that's not quadratic in the uh, for bilinear in the fermions. But you can still solve it. Use, I say elementary algebra, it's tedious elementary algebra, but it's elementary algebra nonetheless. And one thing for this conference, I, well, a few of you were, saw, I gave a talk, a similar talk in Australia. There's, there's some new stuff, but um, a couple of years ago, my last talk before lockdown, it was a Baxter thing, and I found the Yang-Baxter pillow, the great equations of physics on one pillow and then there was the Yang-Baxter equation right in the middle too. So I don't know who made this pillow, but clearly they up there with Euler is, is Yang and Baxter, which is awesome. Um, but uh, I did that to provoke Rodney, but you know, 
I'm not going to do this. One of the things I want to emphasize, free for on methods are very orthogonal to Yang-Baxter-based methods, TQ or beta sots stuff. And to me, that's a good thing um, because it's a different way of looking at these models and you can do things that you can't do, or at least I don't know how to do with the beta sots. And I'll give a very concrete example of that um, in a second. Well, I'll tell you there. The, the thing I'm about to tell you only works for open, but not periodic, and I'll, I'll explain that more precisely. Okay, so let me now, so I said at the beginning, and again, I wanted, one of the nice things about free fermions is I can do every, everything algebraically, um, and uh, let me show you a little bit more how this goes. So again, I mentioned briefly that I didn't even, when I was diagonalizing that matrix, I didn't have to assume any kind of translation invariance or periodic boundary conditions, and I wrote this out here in this a little more abstract way, but hopefully not too complicated. I'm just writing that same Hamiltonian a few slides back as a sum of terms. So this is the spin flip, and that's the nearest neighbor interaction. I'm just allow, now allowing all coefficients and calling these each term h in the Hamiltonian. Okay, so these things satisfy in algebra. Um, so again, nothing to do with the fermions yet. We're just writing down some Hamiltonian. We're going to ask what algebra do these terms in the Hamiltonian satisfy? So a bunch of terms. So basically it squares to the identity up to a constant. So these are just the constants. So it squares the identity operator because Pauli matrices square to the identity. And, and nearest, nearest uh, neighbor in the sense of uh, this, this index there. So this term anti-commutes with its neighbor there. If, if, sig, if j is either, well, if the j here is the same as that one or that one, j or j plus one, then these two anti-commute and otherwise they commute. And that's the algebra here. And in what I described a little while ago, that's all you need to solve the model. So now what the quantum information people did, well, I'm sure someone did this before them, but they say, well, you can write this down as a graph that just describes this algebra here. So you just draw a, a vertex on the graph for every term in this Hamiltonian there. So there's a bunch of them. And uh, I draw an edge if the two anti-commute and I don't draw an edge if they commute. And as long as you can write your Hamiltonian as a sum of terms um, that either anti-commute or commute, you can do this. And I think any term that's uh, on two state systems, you could always do this, split your Hamiltonian down, down enough so they either commute or anti-commute, I think. Um, I won't swear to that though. Certainly the ones I'm describing have that property. And then you can then do what I described a few slides ago, just using this algebra. I never need to talk about any representation. The instruction of those raising and lowering operators here and then the fact that they anti-commute is simply a property of just this, and that matrix I wrote out only depends on these coefficients t. By the way, I should have said, if I had done periodic boundary conditions, the graph would be different, that would loop around and touch that. But this is open boundary conditions. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about something seemingly very different. I'm gonna talk about a model that's not obviously free fermions. So I'm gonna write it in the same form, it's a sum over a bunch of local terms, but okay, just. I'll pause, do this slowly to make sure. It's the same two-state system, but the terms I'm gonna add are just, are three-site terms x, z, z. And I can add uh, z, z, x if I want to. You can see in a second, those all, all commute with each other. It's two separate models, so. Um, but just for simplicity, I'll just add this one for the moment. Okay, so that's my Hamiltonian. And I can write down, Oops, slides before I do the graph. There we go. Um, so the algebra here, again, they all square to, square to the identity times the constant. Um, the nearest neighbor one's anti-commute, but next nearest neighbor's anti-commute because it's a three-site term, so not surprising. Um, and then the other ones commute. So if I want to draw this graph I drew before, again, let's do open boundary conditions. It's each one anti-commutes with its two nearest neighbors. So you can draw this zigzag ladder. Here. And again, I have open boundary conditions, so nothing going around the world. Now, if you do the Jordan-Wigner transformation, the beautiful thing that, that moves the icing chain into free fermions, um, this is what you get. You get a quadrilinear in fermions. It's, it's almost obvious because this thing is just, notice the product of the two kinds of terms in icing. So it's kind of obvious you, you get something that's for fermion, um, and that's it. So the trick I told you before doesn't work. 
beautiful trick, but it doesn't work for this. Um, uh, as a tangential comment, there's some people here, well, at least there's me, I like supersymmetry a lot. This turns out to have a supersymmetry in it, but in what I'm gonna talk about today, that's kind of neither here nor there. All right, so that's one model I'm gonna tell you about. I'm gonna solve all of these models in one fell swoop, but uh, let me tell you about that. So I've put parafermions in the title, haven't mentioned this, but there's several senses, including this one in which parafermions provide the natural generalization of fermions. And um, so instead of having Pauli matrices on a two-state system, I have an n-state system and I generalize sigma x to flip to a shift. So this one just shifts, uh, shifts the spins cyclically, the n states. And then this is like sigma z, um, which just measures, instead of one and minus one, measures a phase for the n states. So it's, it's in many ways the natural generalization, like I said. Uh, it's really strange. So, with, so again, I write down a Hamiltonian and sum of terms, and like this sigma x generalizes to tau, and uh, sigma z, sigma z, I generalize to sigma dagger sigma on the adjacent sites. And you can look at the algebra of this, and for if, these were, if, if n were two, then this would just be a minus sign and we cover exactly what I wrote down for icing, but here you pick up a phase. And this again renders it non-solvable. Everyone who's worked on this has some moment where you think you can now just trivially solve this, but this messes things up for the simple reason is if I move that to the other side, it becomes omega inverse and that ruins your life, basically. Um, yeah, this one, I, yeah, sorry. There, there's, oh, yeah, that, that was missing. Yeah, sorry. Something's funny with the advancing memory. Okay, yeah, go. Uh, yeah, I, I'm wondering, uh, so I, I know that this clock Hamiltonia is free in a sense that. Say, well, I'm going to tell you. Yeah, about you're going to tell not, us about it. But, yeah, but, but is it important that these T's has to be real? No, for not, not for what I'm about to tell you. I see. Because in fact, that was the thing that for some reason didn't show up on the screen, but now I got back, um, which is one thing important to note, this Hamiltonian, except for n equals two, the icing case, is not Hermitian. Yeah. And uh, so no, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, there's some trickery in there that I, I make T real just to make life easier, but that's not Okay, necessary. it's not important. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, right, so notice this Hamiltonian is, is uh, Oh, is there another question? Oh, sorry. Okay, good. Uh, no, it is. Uh, sorry, not trivial. Oh, I, if, if I said solvable, not solvable, that's wrong. Thank you. I said not trivially solvable. Sorry, thank you. It is solvable. Well, no, actually, no, I will. It is not solvable. I, 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 Baxter is a god, but the title of his book is a poor one. Um, the exactly solvable. These models are not solvable. They're integrable. They're not solvable. I, I, so I, I'll stand by not solvable. But, but some things can be computed exactly. Uh, yeah. Actually, that's good. That, that was a good prompt. I, I, I'm going to now try and work that into the talk now. Uh, they're not solvable. They're integrable. Free fermion models are solvable. I would say uh, those, I'm allowed to call those solvable. Right. Anyway, but so this is a funny Hamiltonian that Baxter concocted a long time ago. And okay, and so this was the algebra I wrote down of these things, which is very similar to Ising, except for this phase instead of uh, minus i. Uh, there's another one. Let me just flash for the experts. There's a long range version that goes under a lot of names. It's 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 what I wrote in the previous slide, but we have a longer range Hamiltonian. Um, it, it, it's connected to chiral Potts models and other things that maybe I'll mumble a little bit about later on. And but um, in in the parafermion model in, in the parafermion language, and I haven't explained how parafermions work, but it's a bilinear. But for those of you who may know something about that, all right. So now here's the the crux of the talk. So I wrote down. Uh, well, depending on how you count, I wrote down the icing model, I wrote down this longer range model, this one with the three 
site term. I wrote down then this ZN generalization, another, a different way of generalizing the icing model, and then this other one I flashed. So in a way, four models, or there are two are special cases of the others. Okay, so this is how to solve these models. And to some extent, this is, I guess, sort of trickery that most of it I found just by messing around. But, um, uh, well, I don't know. It's interesting whether you call it trickery or something deep. And I'm not sure there, in integrable models, there's much of a distinction between being tricky or be, being deep. But anyway. So this is the way I, to solve these models. And I, I kind of mean solve in that you can compute the entire spectrum. Okay, so you find, easier said than done, but here in this case, it's relatively straightforward. You can find a transfer matrix. So I mentioned, I've been doing quantum Hamiltonians, but here's now a, a transfer matrix, so non-local thing, and you can think of it as a transfer matrix. And you can find a transfer matrix that commutes with this. So sort of reverse engineer, usually in integrable models, you start with a transfer matrix like that of the six vertex model, and you take some limit um, uh, and find that you get a, a Hamiltonian, in that case, XXE Hamiltonian that would commute with the transfer matrix. In this case, you kind of stare at this for a while and you work out a transfer matrix, and I'll, I'll tell you how to do that in these examples. And one of the things, again, to emphasize, you can do this only using the algebra of these, these H sub Ms. There's nothing else fancier. What? Um, so, then the non-obvious part, but since you kind of know these models might be integrable, you can do Yang-Baxter to show they're integrable, in fact, but you can do directly using the algebra, show that these transfer matrices commute with each other as a function of some parameter. And again, I'll define this parameter for those of you who know something about integrability, which is, I think, most of you, that's the spectral parameter. Um, and in this one case, now you compute the inverse. That's, again, straightforward. And inverse is in quotes because, as in all the standard interval cases, you get T times some other matrix, and it gives you something, but it's some polynomial on this parameter. So it has zeros. And uh, obviously, then, in the, if you hit a zero, it's not an inverse anymore, but those zeros turn out to be very important. So here's, so this, the, the, the first three parts, um, the first three parts, I think it's fair to say, are pretty standard integrability stuff. Here's the part that's very special about the models I just showed you. So you can construct these raising and lowering operators like I did for free fermions easily. Here it's a little trickier, but not that much at the end of the day. Anytime, you have this polynomial here, the, the, the zeros of the transfer matrix times, it, times its quote inverse. So it's got a bunch of zeros. And if you construct the operator that's now the transfer matrix times one extra mode here times the transfer matrix. And you can think of it as an edge mode. And one of the reasons why I've emphasized boundary conditions is basically you put one generator extra at the end that's not in the Hamiltonian that anti-commutes with the thing at the end. I'll write down examples again. And then you do this. And then that beast, believe it or not, after some but not an insane amount of work you can show obeys this raising and lowering operator. And I wrote down these funny free parafermion models. Um, uh, and this has a phase, this phase omega, that's the same there. So if, if this is the, uh, the uh, blanking, uh, the, the icing case or, or the other case, the, the three site model that I wrote down, omega is just minus one and you get the relationship I wrote down before. Yeah. Um, I, I'm wondering here, this existence of this chi, this edge mode, is it yeah. obvious? Because, I mean, naively from your age, like the algebra of this age, it doesn't guarantee there's, a, even it, though you can have yeah, open. Yeah, no, it, 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 certainly in all the cases I've studied, it's obvious in the sense that you, you could literally just take your, the Hamiltonian yeah. and take the last one and then omit it from the Hamiltonian. Uh, yeah, okay. Right, set those t to be zero there, and then okay, that then you last consider a sum there. over yeah. like a one yeah. last term to some extent. Yeah, yeah, okay. And um, so I think, I, 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 let me, I'll answer, give a second part, answer the question after I tell you a few okay, more Okay, thanks. And this is the reason why you cannot apply this technique for the periodic case, right? The, okay. 
that's at least a reason. <laughs> I, I, it's that's a uh, I'll, yeah. Good. Let me. Uh, yeah. No, I'm glad you said that because that's something I don't understand. That's. I think it's worse than that, but that certainly is is one of the issues. Oh, right. Good. Any more? Uh, so I'm about halfway through, right? I have an hour, right? I have an hour, right? It's, I'm about halfway. Good, good. All right. No, I'll get through. This is good. And yeah, I, I internally debated whether to leave this rather miraculous. I don't, I don't know. I don't believe in miracles, but it is kind of nice. So maybe I'll say that. Yeah. I can look at the zero of a non-free model, right? The zero of the transfer matrix. Yeah, yeah. But then that last equation doesn't hold? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it, it, what it is, is it, if you, know, well, you know about TQ stuff. Yeah. I mean, and so the zeros obvious, obviously are essential there. I think, I think in a way of saying it, there's, there's sort of a canonical, there's sort of a canonical Q function or something like, I, I don't know a good way of saying it, but my feeling is this is, it's like that whole setup, but then special things happen here to make this just a single polynomial that works for everything. And so, for example, you know there's cases where you can find the Q function exactly, right? Um, like these supersymmetric models that you, both of us have studied. But see there, it's the Q, it's Q function for the ground state, and then maybe you can work. Here, there's just kind of one Q function for everything, I think might be the, the, the best way to say it there. And so then that's why this property, the epsilon, they're, they're universal epsilons as opposed to just being state dependent. Is that, is that kind of address what you were asking or? Yeah, it's a, I think so. Okay, I say I'm just. <laughs> uh, um, good. Uh, okay, so let me tell you a little bit more detail. So I outlined it there, and I won't. I, I'll be gentle here, but but I, I think I put this on a slide somewhere. But I'll say it in case I didn't. Everything for the next few slides to prove all the things you're literally just doing algebra. And I don't mean sophisticated algebra, you're just doing algebra. And it, it took me many tries to simplify the algebra to the extent, well, to the extent that it's simple. But it, there's nothing, I'm not, I'm not invoking any sophisticated theorems um, after this point. I'm really just uh, doing so. Okay, so let's first do, let me first, um, talk about icing. So I, I told you another way to do icing, but to warm up to the general case, let's let's do uh, let's do uh, the icing thing. So here we go. So all right. So here's how I construct this transfer matrix for icing. And I, I, it's stunning that I don't. I, if lots of experts here, so if you've seen this before, you know, so we've got the icing Hamiltonian I wrote out several times, so I'm not going to write it again. But the Hamiltonian is just the sum of those bits, which were sigma x and sigma z, sigma z, the neighboring ones, and to commute. And then you just notice if I take now, the, just the multiply these two h's, this is, this works in for icing for periodic boundary conditions, but let's stick with open. And you just multiply them such that they're at least two sites apart. So that in this product, it's only term, the, the two bits commute with each other. And you, and you just sum over all that, that commutes with the Hamiltonian. Someone must have noticed this before, but I've never seen it in the literature. I mean, the fact, it's, it's sort of trivial to prove. It takes you 30 seconds. Maybe a slightly longer, but not much longer than 30 seconds. You know, so you do the same thing. You get three of them, and as long as you keep them two sites apart and sum over all of them. So you're not, you're, you knew this. I mean, this must be known. I mean, it's, it, because these aren't bilinears in Fermi. I mean, the usually obvious thing is, you know, is you write everything in terms of bilinears. These aren't bilinears in Fermi. But anyway, it's true, whether it's known or not, it's true. Uh, okay, right, yeah, you're gonna tell me this is, this is not the full transfer, to, 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 to pre-answer, it's not the full transfer matrix that people usually use, by the way. But anyway, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say that, I mean, if you take, you know, the logarithmic derivatives of the transfer matrix, and then, you know, you subtract, uh, you'll take the connected yeah, yeah. part of that, then don't yeah. you get this? Yeah, no, so what I meant is obviously people, in fact, it's only half the conserved quantities you would get by taking the log of the usual yeah. icing transfer matrix. It's every other one. 
Yeah. Really. Right. So that's what I said. So obviously people knew about these conserved quantities. The fact that this, these, it's, it's, we've split the usual conserved quantities in half, where half are, I would say, these are completely obvious because you don't need to know anything sophisticated. And then the other half where you have to know about more sophisticated methods. Okay. That, that's, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Thank but good. But no, good. Okay. Um, but anyway, okay, so this one, and then, so then the, tran the transfer matrix, so, so I said this is not the usual full transfer matrix of the Ising model, it's, it's a it's special. Oh, just, just, for, just for completeness, so the, the other half of the non-obvious uh, charges, how do they look like in your notation? Is it? That's uh, a good question, Robert, you know the answer? How, how do the charge, how do the non-obvious mm -hmm. half, can you write them easily in this notation? I forget. The answer is probably yes, but I don't remember. Just yeah. Yeah, but but they have to be a com. It's not just the near. They have to be arrayed in some combination. Which so the question? Yeah, are they not? So there is an answer, but yeah, I don't remember how nice it is. I mean, it, it, it can't I'm, be that hard. It's icing. If I'm not mistaken, you just take h squared minus the. Like really, the next to each other uh, one. Was, uh, then you get yeah, Q2. Yeah. I don't remember. Okay. Yeah. So but, I don't remember. Yeah, so. because the other one is also conserved. Okay. Uh, I mean, in the periodic case, at least. I'm yeah. yeah. Anyway, with... let's move on from icing because this is that is known. What I'm about to show you was not known till I uh, did. So so remember this other model I wrote down with the three site terms that that algebra. Um, because it's three site, the next nearest neighbor ones anti-commuted with each other as well as the nearest neighbor ones, so that's there, otherwise the same as icing. But now you just use the same trick to write down these things, except now you make them at least three sites apart, because so that all the terms there. And again, it takes only a few minutes to show that all these beasts do. Um, and I haven't worked out, there may be other ones in this case too, but I uh, haven't worked what those out are. Uh, yet. Um, and then, so this thing becomes this transfer matrix and uh, actually, so, yeah, I, I sort of have worked out what the more complicated ones are and they're not nice. And so, yeah, so these, yeah, right, these are the non, if you wish, these are the non-local conserved charges, but you can get the local ones by taking the log derivative. And, and remarkably, uh, this works, the same trickery here works for this pa funny parafermion case where I wrote down this Hamiltonian that generalized, but it's non Hermitian because uh, tau, the thing that the shift operator isn't Hermitian, and I only included tau. But so this literally is cut and pasted from the icing slide. These expressions are exactly the same as icing, just with the different, uh, the different H's defined. You take the spectral parameter of the phases, and this other generalized model can. That's more algebra, but that works in the same way. So, oh well. Hopefully, <laughs> I'm sorry to the people on Zoom if that's. The, um, in any case, uh, if so, so. We can do now this, that we've constructed this, we can do the same thing over. So for this, this long, slightly longer range model, the free fermions in disguise model, which was the title of my paper, it pretty, this part follows exactly the same as I You've got a Hamiltonian, you compute its eigenvalues. Um, it's, it, well, by, by just taking the zeros of a polynomial, and the spectrum is exactly that. I find pretty nice. Now there is one catch here. So if I did this, so this case, uh, uh, you, can, you can get icing as a special case of this if you want by emitting various couplings. But when you do the counting, you see something funny. Okay, so in icing, um, you've got roots here of this polynomial. So it's because depending on how big the polynomial is. But because of that exclusion that I put in, the polynomial is lesser order than there are states. But I've just told you, this has to be the whole spectrum. Well, I told you, and it's not hard to show, this is the entire spectrum. There's nothing else there. So the only thing left is these states must also all be exponentially degenerate, which they are. And, well, 
just is. So you've got a nice free spectrum like this where you fill the levels with plus minuses, but each of these is exponentially degenerate. Yeah. Uh, it implies, but it doesn't <laughs> but, tell but, you but what could the you get those is. Size? It implies there's some additional symmetry there. That, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, absolutely, but, uh, but I'm wondering uh, how many size. And there's some mumbling in my paper about supersymmetry in it, but I couldn't, I couldn't work out the full algebra. There's some algebra of zero mode algebra, if you wish you want to call it, that's responsible for these degeneracies, and you can work out some of it, but I couldn't work out the whole algebra. Yeah, so, but, but then I'm wondering if you get enough size, because in, in principle you need, I mean, L many, right? To, no, uh, I mean, to you just need a non-abelian, all you need is some non-abelian symmetry algebra that gives degeneracies. But I, okay. I couldn't work it out, but in principle you don't need anything. I see, more okay, complicated. thanks. All right, so now to return to, I mentioned before these amazing quantum information people that uh, talked about the free fermion case. Um, the Jordan Wigner case and developed this general graph theory way of saying, when does Jordan Wigner work and when doesn't? And they wrote their paper, which is very nice. Um, and then people, including me, pointed out to us, oh, hey, you know, that's great. But, you know, there's this other case, which is not Jordan Wigner. Can you do this? And, you know, we do things like this to each other all the time, but very rarely um, uh, can people uh, then go somewhere with it. And to, to my, I was just stunned. It's so beautiful. They, uh, they managed to take the case I just described to you, this funny um, extra case. So you write down the frustration graph for these things. And then it turns out again, there were other graph theory things. It turns out you take that graph I wrote down, I guess for the, there it is for the model I just solved, the, the next nearest neighbor model. That was the frustration graph for this, the anti-commute two sites away. And um, so, see, so there's the graph. And they showed that you draw this graph, and I think this is the only condition. There might be one mild one. You write down this graph, and if the graph is even hole free and claw free, so even hole means there's no subgraph that looks like that. And when I draw this, that means this one can't be connected to that. So this, this, there's a hole in there. So those are even holes. And a claw is just this, again, with that one not connected to that one. So even though, so this one, you can see, doesn't have any of these shapes because even though it's got that Mercedes-Benz symbol, then these are connected. And then they prove that for any time the frustration graph looks like this, the trickery I wrote down can work. So maybe it's not really trickery, it's something deeper. And again, the issue, if, you, if I make this periodic, so this is now uh, answering your question a little more, if this periodic, then you get even, you, you get something you don't want. Um, well, at least as far as I try. Uh, now you can do variations and, and come up with ones that work, but with periodic boundary conditions. So periodic isn't quite the right obstruction, but clearly close to whatever the deep obstruction is. Periodic with odd number of sites seems to work. Yeah, but maybe you have a problem I, I with the number. <laughs> no, I had a moment said, these guys are idiots. It works for periodic, but then I, you, you do, I, I forget either. I think you get even, I forget. Yeah. 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 I, I remember it doesn't, I mean, they're, they're smarter than I am. They, they thought of that. <laughs> they, they, they checked. And I, I, again, I thought, oh no, it works. And then no, I, I, yeah, I can't do it in real time, so I, but, 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 but it doesn't. Um, but I say there's variations you can, you can play around and no one, as far as I know yet has really explored, you know, the other models you can write down that, works. There's one simple generalization these models do to uh, uh, Alcaraz, but that one, I mean, it's, it's very nice, but it's sort of ob obvious way of generalizing it, but non-obvious ones, I don't think anyone's doing it. And, and the thing that, so I wrote a paper of, uh, now nearly 10 years ago, solving this free power fermion in a new way. Baxter had come up with these models a long time ago, and then I redid it, but um, you, Please don't have, don't read the proof in that paper at all. You can the results are great, but but using the stuff I just told you about, I can prove everything, and in that paper and then some, uh, using what I told in a much easier fashion, which someday I'll 
uh, publish. But anyway, so what you get for the spectrum for this is really cool though. So the spectrum for this model, this was Baxter's original result. And then I came up with a more algebraic way of doing it, like I say. And o o Yang and Perk then generalized it, as did Baxter, and, and proved a, most of it. But it, it, even nastier than what I did um, there. So it's, it's what I have now is much easier. But the spectrum is um, this form. So it's like the plus minus, but instead of a plus minus, it's a phase. And it's a non-Hermitian model, so the spectrum uh, not only isn't real, but it's, it's not real in this sort of spectacular way, instead of having, um, you know, a thing filled by, uh, you know, either filled or empty, there's three choices, you know, can, it, so there's, there's three levels that are the same here, and it's in any, it's in one, but not more than one and not less than one. It's in exactly one of e there, so you pick that phase and you pick that phase and you pick that one. So it's, so that was Baxter's original result, which is just the bizarrest, thing I've ever, one of the most strange things, but he, he proved it in a very indirect way. I came up with a more direct but uh, nasty way of proving it. Um, but now I have a much nicer way of using what I just told you about. So, so what happens there is then these operators you construct are, I guess call them shift operators. So they move you around here. And then they satisfy this algebra here. So there's no, nothing as simple as anti-commutation anymore for these things. You have to actually involve the energies in this. So there's this, if you wish, is so free parafermion. So I, I called these things free parafermions, but there's something fundamentally non free about them. These epsilons appear in the algebra, even of, 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 of these operators. Whereas in the icing case or this more general case, these things still just anti commute. So, let, okay, good. Yeah, I have a few minutes left. So let me tell you a little bit. Let me go. So that was, I think, it for the parafermion case. I'm going to go back to the non-trivial case, this next nearest neighbor model, and tell you a little bit more about it. So write out again. This is the Hamiltonian. And I say I did ZZX and, and XXZ because these two, all the, each term here commutes with each term there. Again, not obvious. Well, easy to show, but... Uh, maybe not immediately obvious thing. So that's the Hamiltonian. Let's just add them both in since they commute. You can solve each of them individually. So the spectrum is still before. And as I mentioned briefly, let me say it again, each of these levels is exponentially degenerate. Um, and as I answered to Juan's question, at least I can show some of the degeneracies, probably all of them are related to some kind of extended supersymmetry algebra. I, I could work out some generators of this algebra, but I couldn't work out the entire algebra. So I don't know what it's, it gets kind of nasty. Um, so I don't know what the, uh, what, what things, although I, think, I, I don't know the full algebra and thus I don't know what its full representation theory is. Okay, so now let's, let me think like a physicist for a moment. So you take uniform coupling, those T's, let me just take them all the same. I still got open boundary conditions. What you find, so you can compute those epsilons and you can actually compute the roots of that polynomial for uniform couplings. Well, or you can compute at least how they depend on various things. And what you find is if you look at how the energy levels depend on the finite size of the system, they go as not as so the usual Lorentz invariant fashion, which we won over L, but they go as one over L to the three halves. And uh, that's kind of nice. And yes, um, KP, I, I was, it was pointed out to me that this is KPZ. And there's since, I, I will just put out, I, I will harass any KPZ expert in the crowd with a question I've harassed many of them over this week is, what does KPZ have to do with free fermions? Which I think everyone agrees it has something to do with free fermions. And, but there's, I don't think there's a very precise formulation in there, but maybe. So maybe this is a coincidence, but maybe it's not. Oh yeah, which KPZ? The, well, I, thought, I thought this conference, there's only one KPZ. <laughs> Carter Parisi Zhang. Uh, but yeah, the other KPZ, I don't think it has anything to do with the uh, Kanishnik folly of Zavolajikov, but if, if anyone thinks otherwise, that would be great too. But there were three, this is the dynamical critical exponent that comes up in KPZ. Carter Parisi Zhang, Zhang, KPZ. Um, and then if you take that Hamiltonian and now allow for staggering on every third site, so that's these parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, or just the amount of, so if they're all one, then you get the uniform Hamiltonian, otherwise you change them. So that point in the middle is this 
point here, and then you see it kind of breaks down basically to icing. These would just be pure icing points here with lots of uh, extra states there, and then you get this kind of cute phase diagram for this, so it's triality. So, okay, so now I mentioned at the beginning, and now I want to belabor the point. Good, yeah, get, getting close to the end, so good. I can belabor the point a bit. Um, all right, so I emphasize that it doesn't work for periodic, or at least not obviously, and we, we talked about that. But so now, so now let's um, make, this, make the system periodic. You can check it still satisfies the Yang-Baxter equation. It's a funny solution. Has to do with the Perk. It's related to Perk Schultz, but in a representation that, at least that, as far as I know, nobody had looked at. And even Jacques Perk certainly recognized the R matrix, but didn't uh, hadn't seen it in this particular form. I, I can elaborate that to the integrability experts if they want. But anyway, so so this is the situation we had for open boundary conditions. We had these degeneracies and the gap between the lowest state and the next states goes as L to the minus three halves. So now what happens for periodic boundary conditions? Uh, it preserves integrability, but it, it, the degeneracies break and there's no particular reason why they shouldn't. And one might hope, one cannot prove, that there might be a second dynamical critical exponent, say associated with just how the ground state splits, maybe. Uh, numerical friends have looked, the problem is in all these wonderful tensor network methods, there's this huge number of low-lying energy states which makes their life uh, absolute hell. The best numerical scenario, I won't even call it a conjecture yet, is this, this Z prime might be three, it's, but it's so hard to tell, even with heroic numerical work, it might be, this may go as LQ. Um, uh, but anyway, but uh, I've said a couple of times, the integrability is still preserved, but the, the tricks don't work. So uh, again, we, we in the integrability can often say, oh, it's integrability, it's great. But yeah, to address Robert's question, we say exactly solvable. But uh, I, I tried for like a month to solve this model and I kind of know how to do these things. There's people in the room who are probably better at it than me. But uh, it's, it, there, you can try the bait on size, but there's no reference vector. TQ is the most amazing piece of trickery ever, and I tried, but right, you, you, you give me a Q, I will bow down, because it, I couldn't find a Q. I mean, it, there, there must be one, but I couldn't find the Q. I couldn't do it, so please, someone uh, show me, uh, show you are superior to me. I would be delighted to be uh, humiliated, but... Uh, it, it, it's not obvious, and and don't tell me it's in some uh, Reshetikin paper 40 years ago, because it's not. Lots of things are in those papers. Everyone should read those papers, but this one ain't. Um, and and uh, even if this is a numerical challenge too, like I mentioned. I just said, uh, this two scale thing is kind of, if, if people, another thing, another plane, but there's these Motskin chains, and nobody talks about this there, but th they have this same kind of, thing going on where you have, in certain cases, you have certain boundary conditions, you get degeneracies, and then it's basically a ferromagnet, so you get ferromagnetic degeneracies. And then you put on this special boundary condition, and it splits. And they're always talking about Z prime. The, the, this version for the Motz can change is just two, because it's a ferromagnet. Anyway, good, so I got five minutes, so I wanna just flash a few slides on some interesting physics that we spent a while talking about a few years ago. This is mostly just then an advertisement. This just combined the two cases. So take this four Fermi chain, I just told you the physics about, and then just add, add it to the icing, or vice versa. Let's start with icing and add this. And this is four fermions, so it's a, for those of you who thought about this, uh, it's irrelevant. Um, it's not free fermion. Now, in either case, it, this one alone is the weird free fermion. This is the traditional free fermion. But together, they're they're not free Fermi and they're not even integrable actually. Um, but I think it's, it's important to know because there's a lot of people, well, uh, let, me, uh, let me show you the phase diagram. It, it's really, this is really a nice model to test numerical methods. And also it has a lot of nice properties that are related to the properties I've told you about. Okay, so let me just flash the phase diagram. So this is just the Hamiltonian model. That's the usual icing one, going back to uniform so it's uniform couplings 
um, for the four Fermi bits, the, the model I've been studying, and then icing, I'll, I'll allow icing to vary, the two vary in the usual way, but otherwise, this one is translation invariant. Um, so what happens, this is, so down here, the, so you just ignore the funny term, this is just usual icing, you have a critical point there, self-dual, now you turn this on. So it's already kind of nice because the duality persists even when you turn this on. And those of you, it's irrelevant, but those of you who know what happens when you add a four, four Fermi termed icing, you get a non-trivial critical point, which is called the tricritical icing. And I can tell you more uh, either in questions or in private if you want to know more about the physics model. And then the transition between the order and disorder becomes first order. And then way up at infinity, and this thing is the funny three halves, z equals three halves point I talk about there. Um, so why this is nice though is because People these days, you know, there's lots of tensor net, lots of beautiful papers written inventing all these great techniques for tensor networks. Um, and, and they tend to, you know, check in the icing model and then declare victory. But icing, icing model is a fantastic model, but we, we do know a lot about the icing model. If you're going to invent a new numerical technique, test it on something else. And what's nice about this is you're not changing the Hilbert space. You're just adding one other term. And more or less, you, you go to something order one, and you get this very non-trivial critical point, which is described by a, a really interesting conformal field theory and all that. So it's a really nice thing. There's some other things. If you like supersymmetry, uh, it's got a supersymmetry. There too. So it's it's a trilinear supersymmetry. So there's all these interesting things about the model. So again, these models I'm talking about today well, are not, I think, not just mathematical curiosities. Uh, yeah, let me. All right, I'll skip that. It's just more interesting stuff about that model. Okay, so uh, hopefully uh, I got across some of the points. Uh, they wanted to make that these models are special, but maybe not uh, not crazy. Um, one obvious generalization, which I've talked to the the quantum information people, Chapman et al., and they have some ideas and made a little progress. Can you do this for the parafermion? Write down this general thing, and they made some progress, but at least haven't announced any results yet. Um, I don't know what if there's a field theory to this. Um, maybe this isn't the right conference, but but. The, these things, these models that I've written down do come up in uh, experiment. Um, this one is maybe close to this kind of, there's these bizarre 3D integrable models and this free called the Baxter, Bajanov Baxter models and generalizing a one by Zamolodzikov, which is basically the Z2 case. And it turns out the model I wrote down is deeply entang entangled, um, metaphorically speaking, with, uh, with this funny uh, one I wrote, flashed very briefly, and the, that one in turn is connected to these 3D integral models. So I can't help but think that the techniques I use might be useful for these very bizarre uh, things. And going back to the field theory again, I guess same thing there. Does this have anything to do with chiral conformal field theory, these, these things here? And again, I feel it ought to, but I, I haven't been able to show anything. Anyway, thank you. More questions? Hi. Uh, so, so your generalized model had this nice spectrum interpretation in terms of this uh, you know, three-legged graph. So the obvious generalization question is, can you, can you write down a, a model where, where you have n legs in your star? I don't want to steal the thunder of these guys because they came out. They told me about a couple generalizations. They came up not, 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 not the one you just mentioned. Okay. Yeah, I, I but, but, you, you can mess around. I mean, you just have to be careful not to get any claws, but you can find them. But then the obvious next question is: Can you generate the minimal conformal, you know, rational models? The whole series. You got icing, tricriticalizing. No, can you keep... that almost certainly not, because those no. I think, for various reasons, aren't going to have any lattice free thing. Yeah, so I don't know what, uh, yeah, I don't know what, yeah, so you said tricrylicin we could get by combining two of them, but yeah. that's then not, so that, I, I would expect you'd probably get things that weren't CFTs. Okay. I, but that's just a guess. So 
there's also this ZN thing. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things, this is what Alcaraz and collaborators, name I forgot, sorry, um, uh, did. And so they can guess the Z, which is pretty easy to then check is, is correct. Um, and, and it's, it's so they, they do two generalizations. They do both ones. They do the parafermion one on one axis, and they do the longer distance on the other. And then the Z is like uh, N over, if it's P and Q, it's like P over Q. So icing is two over two, so it's one. And you want to describe it as three over two. Hmm. And, and so forth. So if you stay on the diagonal, then they're all z equals one, and that's the sort of motivator to do the okay. comment that I made at the end. Maybe those have something to do with that. Yeah. Okay. No one's looked at it. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Please look at it. Uh, I, uh, you mentioned this spacing L to the minus three halves between the ground state and the first excited state. And, and w w what happens with the higher excited state? Are they also spaced by L to the minus three half? Or? Yeah, there's a formula which I forget. I mean, I, I worked out, there's a formula for epsilon that you can write down. It just then when you specialize it to that becomes three halves, which I should have written down the, the formula for that. I better not try and remember it in real time, but it's in my paper. Uh, so yeah, you can you, you can you can compute that for anything. And so so you 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 mentioned that this model should not be in the universality class of some conformal field theories. So w w what you would expect for the long distance asymptotics of correlation functions? Yeah, I, I don't know, and moreover, I can't compute it because of these degeneracies. Right, because to do it in free fermion models, you basically have to invert. If you wish, you have to kind of be able to take your, you know, the bosonic correlators or whatever, and then write them in terms of the fermions and be able to go back and forth. But because of the degeneracies, I can compute, there, it's not a complete set of raising and lowering operators, precisely because I don't know the full sym the symmetry algebra that's responsible for the degeneracies. If I knew that, then I might be able to do correlators, but I but I don't. Now, I mean, if you break this with the periodic, but then you then you land in the territory of course where you have to now use these interval techniques to compute the correlators. Since it's, I can't even compute <laughs> anything in the periodic case, that one would, would be hard. But uh, but yeah, so that one I don't know how to do. This but this spectrum only the spectrum. Are you, I mean, because of the uh, shift operators that you have a certain point, it looks like a bosonic operator. So are you trying to rediscover bosonization? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I, it's, I'm not trying, but it happened by accident. Yeah, because especially you can take n goes to infinity too. Yeah, I, yeah, I, it, I agree. It, it, it looks like that, but I don't have any... Yeah. But it's not a complete spectrum, you say. It's not well, completely... It's a spectrum. It's not, but because I, I don't have operators, I have some operators, but don't have a complete set of operators that move you around among the degenerate states. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. I, I, well, that is what Juan was saying. I believe they exist. I just don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, don't know what to do. Yeah, so... No, I mean, right, yeah, I, no, let me show that formula because I like it so much and... And I, I, I conjecture that in the paper I wrote in 2013. But I, you, so the one up at top there, you know, yeah, I, it's it's such a nice formula, and it generalizes the commutation, anti-commutation, at least for, for this models is a really natural way. But I don't know what it, mm -hmm. I don't I don't know what it means in field theory or anything. But okay. Thank you. If, if nobody else has a question, I'd just like to make a remark. It's a bit guilty because it's about my work, but uh, essentially, if you choose periodic boundary condition, basically you, you, you get uh, uh, some kind of a generalization of Onzaga algebra. 
uh, we, we, which are, of course uh, is responsible for the face diagram that you show this nice triangle. Basically, you can uh, it, like easily deduce it just from the duality point of view. And uh, yeah, so it's just add a little bit of uh, uh, part to your whole story. But, okay. Yeah, thanks. Good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. No, it's, there, there's certainly much more that uh, I wasn't able to do. Yeah, okay. So let's thank uh, uh, Paul again. Thank you.